What's up, Gila Golfers, and welcome to the Sweet Spot D interview. We are going to talk to Cho Min Tan, the Commissioner and CEO of the Asian Tour, because it's an exciting week for Asian golf. The Asian Tour finally resumes in Phuket, Thailand, with two events, and we've got four Malaysians taking part: the Green Brothers, Gavin and Galvin, Ben Leong, and Nicholas Fung. And this is just the start. Next year, the Asian Tour is going to boast a bumper season with million-dollar events and possibly events in Malaysia as well. To we'll find out more from Cho as he talks about their plans, and make sure you pay attention because we're going to ask three questions at the end of the show. All you need to do is answer the question, tag three friends, make sure you like us on Facebook, Instagram, and you stand a chance to win this great-looking Asian to a cap. Stay tuned. Pay attention. Uh, I want to say it's more relief, uh, more than anything. Um, the last time I spoke to you, Jonathan, was probably, uh, I would say, over a year ago, and. Back then, we were hopeful of restarting the tour at the end of 2020. So uh, it's been a long time coming for our professionals and uh, everyone around the Asian tour, broadcasters, fans, um, other stakeholders. So everyone's really looking forward to the to the restart. That's probably an understatement. Yeah, the biggest stumbling block for us was obviously the, the crossing of international borders. Um, we probably traveled to more countries than any other tour. Uh, maybe the, the European tour comes close, but uh, I mean, we often visit 16, 17, 18 different countries and um, a lot of our staff, players, uh, people involved in tournaments come from 25 plus countries as well. So as you can imagine, uh, it's been very difficult to get uh, quarantine exemptions. It's been um, not for lack of trying. And we understand that each country in Asia is probably a little bit more conservative than the West. Uh, but yes, it's been very difficult and uh, fortunate now that the Thailand government has been very helpful in allowing us to stage the two events in Phuket. Um, hopefully the Singapore government also allows us to do two tournaments in January. Um, and with the gradual relaxation of uh, travel restrictions for vaccinated travelers uh, amongst the Southeast Asian countries. Uh, we're looking forward to resuming, I wouldn't say business as usual, but uh, the new norm very soon. Um, obviously, they've been frustrated uh, and I've been explaining why we haven't been able to restart, probably sounding like a broken record to them but um, they're very happy that uh, we can start playing again. As you can see by the entry list of the two events in Phuket, I'm not sure if you've had a chance to have a look, uh, have a look at them, but uh, very strong, uh, I must say, with Jazz playing, Scott Hen playing, Trevor Simsby's playing, um, Wade Ormsby, who's leading the Order of Merits playing, Ju Young Kim, uh, John Catlin's playing one of the two. Uh, and from a Malaysian perspective, we've got Gavin Green playing uh, Nicholas, Ben, and Galvin playing as well. So looking forward to some good, solid results from uh, our top guys. Uh, we've been working with the promoter Golf Saudi um, on the field. Obviously, the Asian Tour will reward the top 30 players from the Order of Merit. Um, so. Uh, just to be clear, we're doing a combined order of merit for the 2020 season and 21 season. So we're combining the results from the first four events in 20 with the four events that we hope to stage in the next two months. Uh, top 30 from uh, that order of merit, which is eight events. I know it's highly modified and highly irregular, but uh, you know, circumstances uh, are as such. Uh, top 30 will go into the Saudi International, uh, the bulk of the field will be made up by players in the top 200 in the official world golf ranking. There'll be exemptions for top players from several tours like the Japan Tour, Korean Tour, Australasian Tour, as well as elite amateurs as well. So we're hoping that the tournament is going to be very strong from an international perspective and the world ranking points uh, up there as well. 
Um, yeah, um, the 10 events are going to be massive for, for the Asian tour and the prize money's being over a million dollars each tournament. They're going to be huge for us. Um, the fields are going to be full field Asian tour, meaning that we'll get uh, an, an, an allocation for our members of between 70 and 80 players per tournament. Um, and like I said, it's we're going to have top players uh, from the top 200 in the world participate, as well as elite amateurs and those from uh, the other regional tours as well. I mean, we're comfortable with uh, the PIF involvement. I mean, you would have seen that uh, they ha they're involved in the Newcastle United Football Club takeover. Um, they're involved in a lot of investments on a business level, um, having stakes in Uber, Citibank, Facebook, um, they support F1 with the Aramco sponsorship. They're doing a lot of stuff in ladies golf, as you, you would have seen. Um, the European Tour uh, obviously worked with the Saudi International for the last three years. So we're very comfortable with the investment um, and we're putting it to the greater good. I mean, we're very fortunate that they're interested in the game of golf and uh, we really do need this injection in this great game of ours. So. Very happy that they've chosen the Asian tour. Very happy that they've chosen uh, golf as a platform that they wish to invest in. In terms of our recognition on the World Golf Federation, um, I don't see any problems. I mean, we are growing our tour, which is our mandate, it's our mission, um, as is the mission for every tour within the Federation. So um, we don't foresee any issues there. From a World Golf Ranking perspective, uh, the new events will be 72 hole stroke play events. They'll be fully sanctioned by the Asian Tour, um, and they'll, you know, feature on our world uh, on our order of merit. Sorry. So we don't uh, see any problems there. Um, in terms of our relationship with the other tours, um, we have in the past we've had a strong relationship with every tour on the Federation. Um, we're probably the only tour that's co-sanctioned events with every single tour uh, within the Federation and we're, we're very proud of that. Um, look, we, we're very open to continuing our relationships and you would have seen in the media that the European tour um, has said that they won't be co-sanctioning with the Asian tour in the future. Um, our European tour, Asian tour alliance ends at the end of this year and they wish to go their separate ways. Um, Look, it, we have to respect that decision. Uh, we've enjoyed a, a huge sort of history with them doing co-sanctioned events since the very first Malaysian event in 1999. So it's a shame that we can't continue co-sanctioning. Uh, but again, we're very open to doing so. Um, it's a bit of a, a one-way street from their side. So um, we keep our door open. Um, the European Tour and the PGA Tour um, have a release policy where players have to ask for a release if they want to play uh, anywhere outside of that tour um, on any given week. So we respect that policy. Um, however, a lot of the players are dual members of the Asian Tour as well. And the Asian national players um, are recognized or the Asian tour is recognized as their home tour. So we believe that they won't have any issues uh, with releases. And pertaining to the two Phuket events, I believe that all the dual members, regardless of their nationality, have been granted releases. So we'll see what happens in 2022. Um, hopefully we'll continue to see uh, the top players competing in our events uh, without restriction. Um, it, it's really not uh, our intention to stop players from playing around the world. I think um, we've got a lot of players who are dual members of the European tour, the Japan tour, and other tours around the world. So uh, I don't think we would be restrictive if there's a playing opportunity for them and they need to go and play these tournaments to further their careers. Uh, we wouldn't try and restrict their movement, no. Um, that's right. We 
always aim to stage between 25 and 30 events. Um, I mean, you've been around the tour long enough, Jonathan, to, to see the ups and downs of the tour. And we always get uh, around 25 events together, but uh, it is pretty stressful. It is a bit of a challenge doing that on some years. Uh, but yes, the, the 10 events obviously uh, uh, form the backbone of something that we can work around. Um, and like I said, with, with COVID affecting so many different economies, so many different sponsors, we weren't quite sure how many of our existing events would come back. So 25 is somewhat um, conservative. There's 10 events with Live Golf, but uh, we expect tournaments like the tournaments in Korea, the tournaments in Japan, uh, Indonesia, Thailand to come back when travel restrictions ease. So I mean, we expect to run the season from the Saudi International all the way through to January uh, of next year as well. So it'll be a slight uh, wraparound season, but it also allows us to do qualifying school a little bit later as well and not clash with Christmas and New Year. Um, and hopefully the proof is in the pudding. If we have a strong schedule this year, hopefully the numbers at qualifying school and the interest amongst the, the uh, professional community will be very high. And Malaysia is always very, very much one of our uh, uh, I would say one of the, the best destinations for the Asian tour. I mean, we've enjoyed a great history of doing a lot of stuff in Malaysia. Um, for the players, they love it because it's tax free. <laughs> um, but yeah, we certainly look at doing multiple events in Malaysia. Um, hopefully the border restrictions will be, re uh, will be reduced soon and our guys can travel in and out. So I guess once they're vaccinated um, and we look forward to do, doing multiple events, I think the aim for the Asian tour is to do between nine and 10 events in the first half and really stack the second half of the season, which has usually been the case anyways. So Malaysia is very much uh, part of the program for us. Yeah, look, the Asian tour uh, obviously relies on the ADT to provide the lower ranking players with playing opportunities. Uh, we've had a, a very good relationship with PGM in the past through the late Tuna Matsaji. Uh, we're obviously very saddened by the loss and um, he won't be replaced. He was a, a great man to work with and uh, not enough can be said about his contribution to golf in Malaysia. Um, I think the plan for ADT, um, obviously the budgets are not as big as Asian Tour, so we have to be careful about uh, movement patterns for our players, uh, making it more efficient, more economical. So first things first, I think we would look at doing multiple events uh, in host nations. So the players fly in once, play three to four events, and then fly out after that. Uh, we'll look at the economies that open up first. Um, obviously looking at destinations like Indonesia, Thailand, um, places where it's efficient to travel, it's economical to travel, and we're actually looking at doing a partnership with the MENA tour, which is the Middle East tour as well. So hopefully we can stage some events in Asia um, and travel to the Middle East as well. Um, there's no shortage of good golf in the Middle East, and that's definitely a region that we'd like to work with uh, on the Asian development tour. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we hope to continue all the code sanctions that we have with uh, the Korean tour the Japan Tour, um, Australasian Tour, we currently only do the New Zealand Open, but there's obviously scope for us to do more work uh, with the Australasian Tour, especially with Greg Norman's involvement. There's always going to be uh, some, pa some patriotism from, from Greg's side, and we'd love to travel down to Australia and you do more tournaments down there. Um, and there are also other regions like that we'd like to explore, the Middle East region, like I just mentioned. Um, and further west as well, if the opportunities arise. Um, you would have seen by uh, the other tours, namely the PGA Tour and the European Tour, where they're expanding outside of their home territory as well. Um, so it looks like the way forward. I mean, the, the name Asian Tour um, is often uh, misinterpreted as a tour in Asia for Asians, which is not entirely correct. We're open to all nationalities. Anyone can come, can come to qualifying school. We're made up of 30 different nationalities, like I said. 
and we visit lots of places not just restricted to Asia. So looking forward to expanding. I think the ultimate aim of the Asian tour long term is to provide uh, the Asian region with top quality golf where uh, talent can apply their trade in Asia. Um, the Asian fans will be exposed to top quality golf, like I say. And in the past, the Asian tour was seen as a stepping stone tour. So if anyone sort of performed well in Asia, after one or two years, they'd be off to Europe, um, off to the PGA tour, and we'd be left um, without our biggest names. Now, I think for us in the region, we'd like to stay, we'd like to see the players stay and play in Asia and uh, compete at the highest level. Um, live television across the board. That's one very, very important thing that uh, the new partnership with Live Golf Investments brings us, um, live events on TV. Um, that's the only way we're gonna build heroes and a profile for the Asian tour. And hopefully that'll inspire the younger generation to take up golf seriously. And, and they see the Asian tour as a, as a viable career for them. Um, I guess another thing that we'd love to see is an Asian bass player or an Asian tour member uh, or a truly Asian tour member compete and win a major. I think uh, we see the top amateurs uh, competing or the top Asian amateurs competing with uh, amateurs from all around the world um, and being very competitive. So we'd like our professionals uh, to compete in the same way.